Welcome to the 167th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with New York Times bestselling author, James Lee Burke. The Reading and Writing Podcast is sponsored by the book-loving nerds at Riffle. Riffle is an online book community that connects readers with authors and books that they'll love. Readers use Riffle to find the next book that they want to read. And authors use Riffle to make their books stand out and drive sales. Join the Riffle community today at rifflebooks.com. That's R-I-F-F-L-E-B-O-O-K-S dot com. And look for the link in the show notes as well. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is New York Times bestselling writer James Lee Burke. Burke's latest novel, Wayfaring Stranger, has just been published. Burke is the author of the long-running and critically acclaimed Dave Robichaux mystery series. He also writes a separate series featuring Sheriff Hackberry Holland. Burke's novels have twice won the Edgar Allan Poe Award for the Best Mystery Novel of the Year. Benjamin Percy recently wrote that Wayfaring Stranger is a sprawling historical epic full of courage and loyalty and optimism and good-heartedness that reads like an ode to the American dream. James Lee Burke, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me on your show again, Jeff. Sure. Well, I, I wondered if you could read the first couple of pages from your new novel, Wayfaring Stranger. Sure. Um the story is narrated by Weldon Holland uh, at age, he's age 16, and the story begins in 1934. This is chapter one. It was the year none of the seasons followed their own dictates. The days were warm and the air hard to breathe without a kerchief, and the nights cold and damp. The wet burlap we nailed over the windows stiff with grit that blew in clouds out of the west amid sounds that like like a train grinding across the prairie. The moon was orange or sometimes brown, as big as a planet, the way it is at harvest time, and the sun never more than a smudge, like a light bulb flickering in the socket or a lucifer, lucifer match burning inside its own smoke. In better times, our family would have been sitting together on the porch, in wicker chairs or on the glider, with glasses of lemonade and bowls of peach ice cream. My father was looking for work on a pipeline in East Texas. Maybe he would come back one day, or maybe not. Back then, people had a way of walking down a tar road and crossing through a pool of heat and disappearing forever. I ascribed the signs of my mother's mental deterioration to my father's absence and his difficulties with alcohol. She wore out the rug in her bedroom, walking in circles, squeezing her nails into the heels of her hands, talking to herself, her eyes watery with levels of fear and confusion that nobody could dispel. Ordinary people no longer visited our home. As a lawman, grandfather had gone up against the likes of Bill Dalton and John Wesley Hardin. And in 1916, with the group of rogue Texas Rangers, he had helped ambush a train loaded with Pancho Villa's soldiers. The point is, he wasn't given to studying on the complexities of mental illness. That didn't mean he was an ill-natured or entirely uncharitable man, just one who seemed to have a hole in his thinking. He had not been a good father to his children. Through either selfishness or ineptitude, he often left them to their own devices, even when they foundered on the wayside. I had never understood this obvious character defect in him. I sometimes wondered if the blood he had shed had made him incapable of love. He hid behind flippancy and cynicism. He rated all politicians as somewhere between mediocre and piss poor. His first wife had a face that could make a freight train turn on a dirt road. 
WPA stood for we piddle around. If he hadn't been a Christian, he would have fired the hired help. We no longer had any. And replaced them with sloths. The local banker had a big nose because the air was free. Who was my grandfather in actuality? I didn't have a clue. It was right at sunset when I looked through the back screen and saw a black automobile coated with dust and shaped like a shoebox detour off the road and drive into the woods behind our house. A man wearing a fedora and a white shirt without a tie got out and urinated in front of the headlights. I thought I could hear laughter inside the car. While he relieved himself, he removed his fedora and combed his hair. It was wavy and thick and brown and shiny as polished walnut. His trousers were notched tightly into his ribs, and his cheeks looked like they had been rubbed with soot. These were not uncharacteristic uncommon characteristics in the men who drifted here and yon through the American West during the first administration of President Roosevelt. Some people might have wandered off the highway into our road, I said. The driver's taking a leak in front of the headlights. His passengers seem to be enjoying themselves. Grandfather was sitting at the kitchen table, an encyclopedia open in front of him, his reading glasses on his nose. He deliberately stood in front of the headlights to make water so others could watch, he said. I can't speak with authority about his thought processes since I'm not inside the man's head, I replied. You want me to stop there? That, that sounds great. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, well, if someone hasn't heard about Wayfaring Stranger yet, how would you describe your new novel? Well, it's a story of the Dust Bowl era and the Battle of the Bulge and the post-war years and the all boom uh, in the Texas, Louisiana coast area. But it's actually about what Gore Vidal called the golden age, the post-war years in Hollywood and and America's entry into another era, one that some people call the new American empire. It's really about how we got where we are today. Uh, It's, I think, an interesting book. We meet Bonnie and Clyde in this first chapter. And we journey later to the grand opening of the Shamrock Hotel in Houston, Texas in 1947, an event uh, attended by Benny Siegel, Mr. Siegel and Virginia Hill, his lovely companion. They were there in 1947. And it's it's the best book I've written by far. There's no question about it. I'm I'm not very objective, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, 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 do you do you remember the original idea or impetus for for writing Wayfaring Stranger? Well, it, it goes back a long time. I've had the elements of this book in. Pardon me. Excuse me. I've had the elements of this book in mind, Jeff, for over a half century, but I had to wait that long to write it because it's the most biographical work. I've written, and I did not change some of the names and some of the characters I suspect might be recognizable, but I I hope only good comes out of this work today, but I could not have written it years ago. It would have, it would have hurt too many people. And and that's why you felt like you had to wait. You didn't want to hurt people that, that were in your family or that you knew. I probably shouldn't say any more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, it's, I, I, I respect your question. Uh, sure, sure. But I, I, I waited a long time to write it, and I'll let others be the judge of it. Uh, I, I think it's a, I think it was a grand time to be around, and people of my generation, those born during the Great Depression, are probably the last who will remember what people call traditional America. Mm 
And and how would you define traditional America? Well, it was quite different, and in part, of course, because of the privation that characterized the times in which I grew up. And the benchmark back then was whether or not your dad had a job. See, my father had a job, so that meant a child was in tall cotton because the unemployment rate was, oh my heavens, I... I forget what it was. It was 25% in 1933, and it stayed like that. You know, there was a second depression, a depression within a depression in 1937. But um, nobody had any money, but at the same time, I think people appreciated more what they did have. We appreciated the daily experience of just being alive. Um, going to a movie was an, an exceptional experience and it was a great time in terms of Hollywood. The, you know, that era the forties and the fifties produced the greatest films that Hollywood ever made. And, uh, you know, it, it, the era had its downside to McCarthyism, anti-Semitism. The story that Weldon narrates, um, uh, I think it's a, it's a great story. The novel is dedicated to my beloved first cousin, Weldon Binbo Buddy Millette. And my cousin walked all the way across France, went into Germany, across the Rhine, all the way to the Elbe River, where the GIs met uh, the Russians. And in the story, the young Weldon we meet does the same thing. And like welded my cousin. He comes back home with three purple hearts and the silver star and two bronze stars. And in the book, Weldon enters a Nazi extermination camp. He and his first sergeant survive the Battle of the Ardan and find themselves deep inside on their own behind enemy lines in Nazi Germany. And they walk into this camp that the Waffen SS have just pulled out of. And under a pile of corpses, they find this young Spanish girl named Rosita Lowenstein and the sergeant who's from central Louisiana and Weldon carry her for five days through snow. And eventually Weldon marries her in Paris and brings her back to Texas and goes into the pipeline and natural gas business. But he discovers the anti-Semitism that he fought against in Europe is still uh, thriving in his homeland, and he has to deal with that. And he's a man of principle. The story makes use of the Song of Roland, the great chivalric ballad about uh, Charlemagne's uh, battle against the uh, Moors in the Pyrenees of you know, northern Spain. And it also makes use of Lamar d'Artur, the, you know, the story of King Arthur. And uh, it's a, about a man of principle who refuses to compromise his values and, and who gets hurt very badly. But it's a great story about perseverance. Sure, sure. Well, I, I wanted to... I, I I wanted to talk a, a moment about your writing process. I'm curious when you, you you mentioned that you had had the idea for this novel for many many years. I'm I'm curious when you sat down and and decided to start working on Wayfaring Stranger. Did you have the entire novel kind of in your mind, or or does does it grow as you write it? What what's that like for you? Well, I never see more than two scenes ahead into a book. I never have. I don't know how they're going to end. And um, each day, I think I discovered the story rather than create it. Um, Leonardo once said he didn't carve the sculpture, he freed it from the stone. And I think, at least for me, that's what art has always been about. It's the story, the painting, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the song is buried in the unconscious and it comes from somewhere else outside of a person. Faulkner said that right before his death. He said, had I not written the books, they would have been written for me by another hand. Hmm. And, and do you ever find with that, do, do you ever find that you, um, 
uh, that you possibly write yourself into a dead end or that you have to back up and maybe throw out some pages or chapters or, or does it just, is it like you're saying the process that you just kind of uncover it as you go? Well, I rewrite every day. I, I, I try to get 750 to a thousand words a day. It's usually about 750. And then the next morning I rewrite that and then create another 750 words. And I do it seven days a week and I just stay with it. And then all the way down the road, it usually takes close to a year. I, <laughs> I look in my basket and, uh, I say, I declare it looks like I finished a book. <laughs> so, so many reviewers and, and also readers ha- have sung your praises in terms of your descriptive writing of really um, making your settings. And, and I'm thinking of South Louisiana specifically coming alive on, on the page. Was that rich description and language there for you when you first started writing fiction in, in your 20s? Or is that something that you've consciously worked on over the years? I was influenced a great deal by Gerard Manley Hopkins, the Jesuit poet, and it was he who resurrected interest in what is called the metaphysical image, the imagery of Andrew Marvell and John Donne and George Herbert, of course, uh, the metaphysical poets of the uh, 17th century, late 16th early 17th century and uh, Hopkins notebooks had a lot of influence on me F. Scott Fitzgerald certainly did William Faulkner uh, Flannery O'Connor I think I was fortunate in that early on as a reader I read only the best writers. I've always tried to avoid reading bad prose or bad poetry. It, it's like watching bad tennis. It messes up your game. You know? So uh, a, a writer cannot read enough. But eventually a writer then establishes a style that's his own, but at the same time it should never become static. That he... This is why Faulkner was our greatest writer. He was never satisfied doing something one way. That His books are like textbooks in experiment. I think probably the best novel in the English language is The Sound and the Fury because of the level of experimentation involved in it. Um, but it's nothing like the novel As I Lay Dying by the same author, William Faulkner. He kept doing things differently. That's why he rated Thomas Wolfe uh, from North, the North Carolinian mm-hmm. as our greatest writer, because Wolfe constantly experimented. Sure. Well, well, as we discussed, Wayfaring Stranger has a historical backdrop, including Bonnie and Clyde and World War II and the Battle of the Bulge. And did you do any specific research in, in the process of writing the novel? No. Oh, I checked some details, but uh, no, I, I already knew the story. The events happened that right. I write about, and the characters running around in the story <laughs> are reflections, at least, of people I knew. My best women characters are in this novel. Rosita Lowenstein's a great character. And then we meet Linda Gale Pine from Bogalusa, Louisiana, who is like a rolling thunderstorm. She's a, a country girl who becomes a famous Hollywood actress. And we meet uh, Bugsy Siegel after he- after he has purchased the home next door to Jack Warner. That's a fact. Here was Jack Warner, the most famous and powerful man in the entertainment world. I mean, in the entire world. And Benny Siegel buys the house next door to him. (laughs) Siegel used to walk through Warner's hedge into his um, kitchen right into the living room of his house without even (laughs) knocking. And he terrified Warner, evidently. I mean, as he would anybody. 
But, it, you know, B- Bugsy Siegel actually had a screen test. I mean, who was going to turn him down? <laughs> it's living next door to Warner. But anyway, my f- the funniest scene I have ever written is in this book, and it deals with an encounter between Weldon, the main character, after he comes back from Europe, and Benny Siegel at the Shamrock Hotel. <laughs> In Houston, <laughs> that's great. Well, well, do you, do you have ideas? Do you have ideas for other historical novels in the same scope as Wayfaring Stranger? Yeah, I'm writing one now. It starts in 1916 in revolutionary Mexico. That's great. Well, what what advice do you have for aspiring writers who may be listening, who who would one day like to have you know their own novels or short stories published? Never quit, never give up. And I, 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 this rule that I learned for myself when I was 20, I, I was, uh, well, I worked briefly offshore, offshore oil exploration, and we were on the drill barge 10 days, and then we'd be five days back on land. And I rented a mailbox, and when I was back on land, I wrote all kinds of things, and I would send them off to magazines. And my rejection slips would be waiting for me (laughs) when I got back to land again. But I determined at that time never to leave a manuscript at home more than 36 hours. And I kept that rule with a couple of exceptions all these years. The work goes right back out. The one way to assure defeat is to let a manuscript stay at home. But if you have a creative gift, it was put there for a reason. And if you just stay true to your own vision of the world, eventually the reason for the gift will become manifest in your life. And you just you you discover that the booze always come from the cheap seats. You know, everybody in baseball knows that. And you never listen to the excoriation or the you know demeaning of your work or it's <laughs> You discover that far more people will discourage than will encourage you. And it's a lonely pursuit, but you just never get up. You you, you never give up. Sure. And I'm curious. I mean, you were talking about writing these things at 20 and coming back in from from working offshore uh, oil drilling and, and, and mailing them out to magazines. I'm curious. Do you remember what what originally um motivated you to sit down and and try your hand for the first time at fiction back back then well i i wrote my first published story it was published in a college magazine when i was 19 and i started my first novel half of paradise when i was 21 and i finished it at age 23 it took a while to get it published but I've been doing it ever since. And my first cousin was Andre Debuse, who lived in Bradford, Mass. He was from Lafayette, Louisiana. But Andre and I were four months apart, and we were uh, kind of each other's pacing horse <laughs> over the years. You know, he was a great short story writer. He was probably the... He was arguably one of the best we've ever produced. Andre was a great short story writer, and his son lives there now, Andre the Third, Andre Debus the Third. He wrote um, of Sand and Fog, House of Sand and Fog. He wrote uh, Townie, and he said, "He, Andre the Third's a great writer too." Sure, sure. So, so were you were you competing with your cousin then? Well, yeah, but I mean, not in a. I mean, we. Uh, this sounds self-inflated, but a person who's really in love with his art doesn't think in a competitive way. Sure, sure. And it's a big club, and uh, this this is why that being a writer is just it's just a great pleasure because you have few bad experiences. I mean, the people who buy books, who read books, who publish them. I, with rare exceptions, are good people. Sure. Well, you mentioned earlier that you're working on another historical novel now. Um, I'm curious, uh, are there plans um, for another Dave Robichaux? Oh, I don't think about it too much. I just <laughs> write the story that 
was on my mind at the time, and I've published, I think, uh, thir- 33 novels and two collections of stories, and I've just never really planned any of them. So, and I've pub- I've written books that were not published as well. My novel, The Lost Get Back Boogie. Uh, was rejected 111 times before Louisiana State University Press accepted it. And it was under submission for nine years. And my wife had kept, my wife Pearl had kept saying, Jim, send it to LSU Press. And then finally I thought, well, maybe it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> that could have saved nine years waiting time if I had listened. <laughs> So, so that so that time period, and we've we've talked about it before, and we talked about it in in the previous interview, which I did with you, and I'll have a link to that in the show notes, so people want to go back and listen to that first interview. But we talked about that time period when when you, uh, you when you did go unpublished after having your first two or three novels published. Uh, I'm curious. I mean, did did it ever? I mean, in your wildest dreams, did you ever think that you would be where you're at today? Well. Uh... I learned a lesson during a long period in the middle of my career when I couldn't publish anything. I I don't know how many rejections I got. Um, I had published three novel hardback novels in New York, and then discovered that, uh, boy, I was just getting started in terms of rejection. <laughs> but I I learned that an old lesson: you do it a day at a time, and you do it for the love of the work itself. And after you finish it, you put it into submission and you start something else and you let God be the measure of it. And that if you're true to your craft, eventually success will find you. But you never do anything that that is that hard for money. If you write for money, you'll never make any. And there's another thing a person can be assured of. If he has success, eventually it'll go away from him. And if you accept that at the time, it's not a painful loss. But it'll go away. It's the nature of fashion. And then it'll come back again at some point. But uh, you just have to wear the cloak loosely. You know the admonition in the Bible, I think, where the world is a loose cloak. It's pretty good advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's great advice. Well, well, again, we've been speaking with James Lee Burke, New York Times bestselling writer. Burke's latest novel, Wayfaring Stranger, which we've been discussing, is available in bookstores now. So go grab a copy. And Jim, thanks for doing this interview. Oh, thanks for having me on the show again, Jeffrey. You always do a great job. Thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs>